precious cornerstone. Numbers are really neat. Whether you're a math person or an English person, whatever you are, numbers are really cool. Why? Because they always equal something. In this lesson, John Thomas is going to take us in 2 Peter chapter 1 in a lesson titled, It All Adds Up. Peter in this passage of scripture is going to give us a, a list of things and when you add them all together, it helps you to be somebody who looks like Christ in the real world. Join us as we study this passage in 2 Peter chapter 1. You're the promise, Jesus, you are all to us. It's good to see each one of you back again tonight. Uh, tonight, our lesson is entitled, It All Adds Up. And i got to begin with a little bit of a nerd alert. I'm going to share a little bit about myself. I have always liked numbers. Uh, from a young age, I like numbers. They're predictable. They're specific. If you're dealing with math, it's either right or wrong, and I like that idea. I like that you have the correct answer or you don't. Uh, growing up, I liked the fact that they were ex exact. Uh, numbers help me set goals. I don't know about you, but I was sitting there, I remember being a freshman, and I watched a guy, I'd have to, in the middle of a the game, they stopped it. They came out and gave him a football, and he'd gotten a thousand yards, and I thought, a thousand? That number's better than any other, and that helped me set goals. Or I thought about, you know, whenever it came to grades, I had my, I wasn't, you know, didn't have to hit the top of everything, but I said, this is the number that's acceptable for me, and I picked it out, and I wanted my grades to be at that level, and decided to do that. Uh, financially, I like the fact that it all adds up, and uh, I like doing the little things right. If you do all the little things right, uh, math is always right, it all adds up. Uh, you'll never see, uh, if you don't know me that well, you'll never see somebody so excited about saving money on gas. Every cent. Every little thing that you can do, you can save money on gas and get those Kroger points. And Ben and I have been playing that game and figuring out cash back on a credit card. Of course, you've got to pay it off every month. But man just has little money that comes back there. You start thinking about everything because I was always taught if you watch your pennies, then your dollars take care of themselves. You watch the little things and everything else sort of just adds up. So you shop for the best deals, you're always just looking at the clearance rack and what's happening, you make all these little decisions right and eventually it all adds up. Uh, that made me enjoy stuff. When it comes to investing, I enjoy that. What? Compounding interest, return on investment. You look at companies, you look at different things and you see what happens and money always kind of adds up because it's predictable. Well, Peter's talking to us in 2 Peter chapter 1. I hope your Bible's open there. We're just going to be covering six uh, verses tonight as we look at it. But he's talking about something that is equally predictable. Equally, it adds up. And he's going to use it, and I'm going to be looking at New American Standard and King James, or New King James I'm used to. He was saying, add to. Okay? Add these things together. But what he's talking about is not just something when it comes to sports or grades or money. He's talking about your spiritual life. There's some steps that you can take, and if you're a list person, then tonight's your night because he's going to give you a list of things that it's one step at a time. It's one thing that you're doing, you're going to add this to this to this, and as you add all of those things together, it's going to add up. But what it's adding up to is a beautiful promise that we have, something that we have been told that God will help us to get to that we looked at last time when we looked at verse 4. You look there in Second Peter chapter 1 verse 4 and what did he say that we could do he says that we have these precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust what he says that we can have is we can escape we can escape this world and all the things that can control us by lust and instead be partakers of the divine nature What's he saying? We get to become more and more like God if we'll add one thing to the other. So let's look at our study and see exactly what he's talking about. The best way that you can, uh, you know, best way that I can emphasize this, is Peter's just going to come through and he says, look, you've got to add all these things together to become uh, partakers of the divine nature is not an easy task. 
Uh, it's going to take a number of different attributes. He's not going to say it's going to be one thing. It's going to be one on top of another. But eventually, they're going to add up. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5. He says, for this reason, if that's your goal, if that's what you want to become, apply all diligence in your faith, su supply moral excellence. In your moral excellence, knowledge. Right off the bat, he says, look, if you want to get to this goal, if you want to accomplish this in your life, if you're wanting to partake in the divine nature, if you're wanting to escape the hold that the world has on you, right off the bat, he says, it's going to take diligence. You think about diligence as care for persistent work or effort. I'm going to be careful about it. I'm going to pay attention to it. I've got to look at every different thing because for things to add up, you've got to pay attention to the small things. Think about that whenever it comes to a diet. How many people, January 1st, well, I'm going to start a diet. But if you're not careful, and if you're not persistent, and if you're not adding all the small things together, then it's not going to work. Man, the apps, if you've ever tried that, now you can get an app and say, how, much, how many calories did I take in? And I remember doing that for just a little bit where I was looking at every amount of calorie I came, took in because weight is about calories in and then how much you spend on exercise. And every little bit adds up. But it takes a ton of diligence to pay attention to everything. And he says, look, from the beginning, if you're wanting to accomplish this task, you're going to have to be careful. You're going to have to pay attention. You're going to have to realize that little things matter. Who you're with, where you spend time with, all of these different things to take these steps. For them all to add up, you're going to have to apply yourself. And the first thing he tells us is, you need to add to your faith. You need to have moral virtue. Moral excellence. Other versions will have virtue there. What's he saying? If you want to partake of the divine nature, then you're going to have to think about your behavior and you're going to have to set a high standard for what you want to be. It's going to be behavior that shows those high moral standards. And we live in a world that don't, doesn't have standards. Shame has disappeared. People are doing whatever they feel right. But whenever you want to say, I'm going to be what God wants me to be, I can't look at other people's standards. I can't see what they do with honesty and say, well, I'm as honest as they are. I can't sit there and look at other people's idea when it comes to modesty or look at the world standard whenever it comes to all these other issues and say, I'm going to compare myself to them. No, when I have moral excellence, when I'm searching after virtue, I'm raising the standard. So from the beginning, I've got to have that faith and I'm going to be diligent to raise the standard of what God wants for me. But again, I'm going to have to pay attention to the little things for it all to add up. He says add to that moral excellence or add to that virtue knowledge. Knowledge is going to be key. You can't be what God wants you to be without knowing who God is and what he has revealed to you through his word. So many times today that's the struggle that people are facing in the religious world. They're going to places where they don't look at what God says. They just hear what an individual says. There are people that want to have a relationship with Jesus, but they haven't read and seen what the Bible says. They can listen to people that will teach and tell them all kinds of characteristics, but they don't come back to God's Word. And because they don't have the proper knowledge, it doesn't matter what you're doing if you don't have the right knowledge. Think of Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, where it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. To get there, we're going to have to know some things. To get there, we're going to have to dedicate ourselves to study. To get there, we're going to have to spend time looking at God's Word and finding out exactly what He wants us uh, to be and knowing Him better and better. Because the more we know about God, the closer we come in a relationship with Him, the better our walk will be. Verse 6, he says, Now to our knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. In your perseverance, godliness. He brings up the difficult one of self-control. When you think about becoming what God wants you to be, you can have that faith. You can set high standards for yourself. You can even know the right information. But at some point, you have to say, those, the things that I know are going to control me. I'm going to allow God to control me and not my desires. I'm not going to go after what I feel like at the moment. I'm not going to say the things that I feel like saying. I'm not going to let my emotions or the standards of others control me. Instead, I'm going to allow God to control me, and I have to watch the things that I do. And I have to add that to me on a regular basis. I know what to do. The question is sometimes, can I make myself do it? 
And self-control comes up time and again. I am so thankful that self-control is listed as one of the fruits of the Spirit. God's Spirit wants to help me. God's Spirit wants to be within me and work in my life in such a way that I can come to control myself regardless of the situation and have the control that He would want us to have. We've got to have it. So what do we have to say whenever we see that characteristic? What we can't do, and sometimes what we're tempted to do, is say, well, I can't help it. That's just the way I am. You know, that's just the way it is. And sometimes we say, oh, well, that's it. But whenever we see this characteristic and we say, look, if it's all going to add up, so many times when it comes to all the information you have is one thing, are you going to do it or not? And we have to make a decision to say, I'm going to dedicate myself to do what God wants me to do. I have to determine that whenever I have the knowledge of God and I know what He wants me to do, I can't let something else cause me to stray from that. I can't sit there and come into this situation and I know God wants honesty, but I'm going to get in trouble, so I'm not going to tell the truth. I can't go and say, I know that God expects me to be a certain way, but then whenever I get faced with this situation in order to fit in or in order you know, to get by with whatever the situation is, to give up, I have to make sure that I am what God wants me to be. I think as we do that and as we add to it, we ask God to bless us. We ask God to give us the power. We ask God to work within our lives, to have the self-control that we need to have. And he says, add to that perseverance. How many times do we start something that we really want to do when we get all fired up, but we don't follow through? We have an elliptical and a treadmill in the basement of my house. Anybody else? I remember whenever I got that, I said, oh, you need something to hang your clothes on too, right? That's what you do with a treadmill. You get, the, you know, you get your uh, clothes hanger, and that's what you hang everything on. Both of those are sitting in my basement, and I've been thinking for a month, you know what, it'd be really great if I went down there and did something on those, but they're just sitting there. Now, there are times where I got on them and put in a lot of miles, put in a lot of hours, and you do that, and we go through a period of time, and we get real fired up, and we're going to do what we need to do, and we're going to stick to it, and then we just simply don't persevere but he says look if it's all going to add up to be what God wants us to be we have to determine uh, to persevere I've got a story I want to share with you about that some of you are, are familiar with the story most likely because it's you know been on a big stage for a long period of time but some of you I don't know if you've ever heard of team Hoyt it's a father-son combination of a father who had a son who was disabled he was born in 1962 Whenever he was born, he had a lack of oxygen, and because of that, their son uh, couldn't, get a, couldn't walk, couldn't do a number of different things, uh, was very disabled, but they kept noticing their kid. The doctor said, you need to institutionalize the son. He's never going to be able to do anything, but they watched him, and they saw his eyes follow, and they saw all the ways that he worked. Like, something is going on here, and they were early on at what would you do with a child with disabilities, and they had to really go to fight for their son, and uh, they were able to get him into school, but it was even much later on. They got him a computer where he could sit there and move a cursor, and this is in the 70s, and he could go to the right letters and click, and he could bump his head against the clicker and could spell out what he wanted to know. And as he got there, they finally got him hooked up, and they're thinking, okay, you know, they've taught him, the, they've tried to teach him to do all these different things, and mom, is it gonna be dad? What's the first words of a teenage son? It was go Bruins. The Bruins were in the Stanley Cup Finals, and they were, they, were, they, were, they were ready to go. Go Bruins. He loves sports. In 1977, uh, Rick told his dad that he wanted to participate in a five-mile run that was raising money for a lacrosse player at his school who had been paralyzed. So his dad wasn't much of a runner. He you know, hadn't done a whole lot of distance running, but he got an old wheelchair, and he put his son in it, and father pushed his son in this five-mile race. I want you to read a little bit to you from their website on what they talked about it. He said he agreed to push Rick in his wheelchair and they finished all five, five miles coming in next to last. That night, Rick told his father, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like I'm not handicapped. That statement to his father was the spark of a motivation of years and years and years of running. That was 1977. 2013 was going to be their last Boston Marathon. 
which was going to be, I believe, number six, and that's when the bombing happened. So they actually put it off and said, all right, we're going to do 2014. In Boston, they have a statue of he and his son, uh, of, of Dick pushing Rick through these races. But it says this realization was just the beginning of what would become over a thousand races completed, including marathons, duelathons, and triathlons, six of them being Ironman competitions. Now, if you're in the crying mood, go to their website and you watch what this father does with his son. He goes out there and when they're going to swim, again, some of those Ironmans are 130 plus miles on a bike through the water and pushing. But he would put his son in a raft. He'd have to pick him up, set him in the raft, would have a bungee attached to him, and he would pull his son through the water. He'd get out and put him on the bicycle, and they had a two-seat bike where he'd be on the front, and he would go along, and then he'd push him the 27-plus uh, miles after the fact. It says, Dick and Rick biked and ran across the United States in 1992, completing a full 3,735 miles in 45 days. In a triathlon, he would pull Rick in a boat with a bungee cord attached to a vest around his waist to the front of the boat for the swimming stage. Then he would ride a special two-seater. Dick would push Rick in his custom-made running chair for the final stage. When you watch his father and you watch what they're doing in all the races, you think, how in the world? A thousand races, some of them being a hundred miles plus traveled. It was one step at a time. You have the Jimmy V Perseverance Award that uh, ESPYs give out, and they received that award, and they honored this father. And these people have been known, and they started a foundation, and they have done so much good, and it's all these amazing things from a dad who simply loved his son, and he decided, I'm going to make a decision. But when he started making that decision, it was a daily thing. Five mile run, nobody was going to know you because of that. It wasn't going to matter, but he was going to take one right step. And then his son said he loved it, and it was something that he wanted to become, and it was something that he could be a blessing to him. And perseverance is what happened. Decade after decade of perseverance, and people look back and say, what, what a beautiful life. Perseverance is easier when you have something you love. That's why we're told from the beginning, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. When we love Him, we're going to be willing to push through. We're going to be able to add all these other things up, and we have to give ourselves to that. Perseverance is easier when you have somebody else there with you. Be many times, I'm sure, if he was trying to do that for himself, he wasn't interested. But together we do that. I think of that as, as children of God, as a family, as a church family. It's easy to give up, but if you've got somebody else that's going to meet you at the track, it's easier to run. If you have somebody else you're going to go through it with, it makes it so much easier. And he's saying, look, as we're adding all these things together, one of the things we need to add to our lives is just, I am going to stick to it. That's why Sunday night's important, isn't it? Aren't you encouraged when we come together and we see each other and say, look, regardless of what's going on, we're going to go through this together. Regardless of the ups, regardless of the downs, we're going to persevere. We've got to add perseverance to the mix in order for it to all add up. He then says, to our perseverance, add godliness. Now, I like what Jeff Bridges said about godliness. He said, this is a personal attitude towards God that results in actions that are pleasing to Him. It's going to be the idea of devotion towards God. And devotion isn't just, it's not really an action as much as it is an attitude. Whenever we think of godliness, I'm going to live in such a way that I am thinking of God. And as he talked about the idea of devotion to God, he says it's going to come, as we've already mentioned, from an idea of a love for God. When it comes to devotion, and I'm going to devote myself to someone, it comes from that proper perspective or that fear of God, fear of the Lord. You know, you have the idea of this respect that you're going to have because I'm going to give devotion to someone who is greater to me than me. And it's going to be a desire for God. But devotion is going to always lead to action. So godliness is, whenever I have this idea of God, we know we can't be who He is in every way, but I have a love for Him, and I have a fear for Him, and I have a respect for Him, and I have a desire to please Him in such a way that I'm going to try to walk in a way that I'm simply replicating what He has been for me. That's why I loved our prayer this evening. What were we praying for? We were praying for us to become 
what God wants us to be, to become godly. And the result of all those actions and the result of the things that we do when we become godly is that it's going to bring honor to our God. Verse 7, he gives us a few more. He says, in your godliness, brotherly kindness. In your brotherly kindness, love. Brotherly kindness, the quality of being friendly, being generous, being considerate. You think about some of the simple things that can come through kindness. It says, look, if we're going to be partakers of the divine nature, we serve a God who is kind. We serve a God who cares for others. We serve a God who is generous and he's going to be a giver. And we have to decide that we have all these different facts, but we have to add it to the piece as well. I think as you look at all these things adding up, and many times it's like a ladder and every ring is going to be important. And sometimes in life, as you look at this list, you may say, okay, these things I'm doing well with. There may be other things you witness tonight and you say, look, I've got to make sure that I sure that up. Because you don't have the ability for them all to add up if you don't have every part. Brotherly kindness is so key. But he says, you have brotherly kindness, and he says, add to that love. You can be kind to people that you don't love. You make a decision, you're going to be polite, you can open a door, you can sit there, and, but in your heart, you're just going through the kind motion. And when it comes to being a Christian, we don't have a Lord who encourages us to go through the motions. He encourages us to change ourselves from within. To become who He is, we love God first, and then we love our fellow man. And if I love my fellow man, kindness is going to come from the fact that I care for you. That's why I want to be kind. This isn't just one more thing that's going to be an act, that I'm going to be kind and polite. But it's going to be, well, as I'm coming to the idea of brotherly kindness, it's going to come from a place that I want to put you above myself. Why? Because that's what my Savior did. He put you and your needs above His own. So as I try to become like Him, I'm going to put someone else and their needs above our own. To complete all those attributes, I think they need to be wrapped in love. Love for God, love for our fellow man, and when we do these things, I think it all starts to add up, and God is going to bless us. Look at verse 8. He says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How will you know when you have start to become what God wants you to be? When you start to have these qualities and you've started to add these things and you have paid special attention to it, you've given special diligence to it and you've said, look, I'm going to continue to strive to be these things. I'm going to ask God to transform my life from within and give me the power to be these things. He says, he uses sort of the negative. He says, you won't be useless or unfruitful. You won't be, and I think in New King James you have barren or unfruitful. If you do these things, things are going to show up in your life. You're not going to be useful, useless. You're not going to be unfruitful. We never want to be people who claim to be followers of Christ, but we're not fulfilling our use in His kingdom. We don't want to be people who are going to claim to be following Him, but as you look around our lives, there's nothing really that you're seeing that is bringing fruit to him. I think of Jesus' words in John 15, verse 5. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. So when we start to put all these things together, it adds up. Well, what does it add up to? It adds up to where Jesus is going to be glorified because of the things that start to happen in our lives. I believe whenever we start to add these things and we take upon ourselves the divine nature, it's going to change our personal relationships. It's going to change what's going on within our family. It's going to change what goes on with our neighbor. It's going to change what goes on with the type of friend we are, the type of spouse we are, the father, the mother, the son, or the daughter. It's going to change what we're doing. And there's going to be things that are going to bear fruit. When we dedicate ourselves to this, people are going to look at us and say, there's something different. Because following God always brings about fruit, will be useful. They'll add up to a life that is useful for God and for His glory. And that's what we want to simply do is point to Him. Verse 9, he says, He who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. 
So he said, we have this great goal and we're looking for all these things. And if we do it, we're going to bring about fruit. And then he reminds us, look, let's don't be blind. Let's don't be short-sighted. Make sure that we see life for what it is. Make sure that we see every day for the purpose that God would have us to, to see in our lives. You have the idea if you can't see it, you're never going to reach it. But look, we're going to keep our eyes open. We want to make sure that we see it. We can't be short-sighted. I think of that idea of being short-sighted. You're not seeing life for everything that it is meant to be. Now, the devil wants us just to constantly look at the things that are up close, look at what's happening today, become overwhelmed with the minutiae of life and all the little things that happen, and never think about eternity. To, you're never going to be what God wants you to be if you're constantly distracted with what is happening right in front of you. What he says is, look, you have the idea of where we're going, of what our goal is, of what we want to accomplish. And I'm not going to be short-sighted. I'm taking the long view of life with my actions, with my behavior, with what I've done. I think of that, and I've mentioned many times before, the idea of taking the hundred-year view of life. A hundred years from now is what you're worried about today going to matter. A hundred years from now, whenever you make this decision, what would be the best way that would make this decision in view of eternity? Because what we do many times is we're making next week decisions. We're making next month decisions. Maybe we're making 20 years from now decisions. But sometimes that can lead to us simply being short-sighted. Where do we want to be a hundred years from today? Live based on that realization. He says, people that are doing this, if they're blind or short-sighted, they had forgotten about his purification from his former sins. What would keep us from doing that is when we forget. It is so important what we do here every Sunday morning. We come together to remember. And he says, what keeps somebody from seeing the long side is we just forget what Jesus has done. He says, you've forgotten your purification and a couple things that happen whenever we gather around this table and we've got to focus our mind and be diligent about it as well. But the first thing that we do as we gather around and think about Jesus is we've got to remember we were lost forever without hope. But he gave himself for us. Not only do we remember that we were lost, we have to remember that Jesus gave his life for us and the outcome of that was forgiveness. When we come and we remember that we were purified, it only happened because God offered forgiveness to us. And that starts to change the way that we're going to face others. Because I've been forgiven, so I'm going to go and I'm going to forgive. Remember the cost that it took. His body and His blood. If we ever cease to remember that, we're going to cease to be what God wants us to be. That's why on a regular basis we're called to gather and to do it. And it's why, we're so, why it is so important. Jesus cleanses us of all of our sins. We always remember Him. We always meditate on Him. We never, never forget. So he says then in verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about His calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. It's a pretty big promise, isn't it? I would love to make sure in every way that I live a life that's making my calling and my election sure. The fact that God has called me, He's allowed me to know the truth. He's given me an opportunity to be chosen by Him and to be within His kingdom and to be one of His children. And I can know the promises that He's given to me and they're things that are sure. And as I understand those truths, it keeps me from stumbling as I strive to be everything that He wants me to be. All these things add up in such a way that we can be certain. We can be certain that we have received the call. We've received the choosing, the election of God. So add to your faith, moral excellence or virtue. Add to your virtue, knowledge. Add to your knowledge, self-control. To your self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. And they will all add up. What's the result? The beautiful promise we see in verse 11. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Entrance into the eternal kingdom. Isn't that what we're all living for? That's the long view, that's the long goal, and that's the promise we have if we'll put these things into our life. 
I hope that can be an encouragement for you this week. I hope that as we go into the week, we can continue to add these things. We can receive these blessings and we can reflect our God's glory. Tonight, the Lord's invitation is also open, as it always is. Uh, we're so thankful for those who have tender hearts as we thought about that this morning. And maybe as you've reflected on your life, you want to continue to consider what you need to do to be right with Him. Every small decision matters. Make the right decision. Maybe tonight it's time for a big decision. Maybe it's time to say, look, I'm going to give myself to the Lord and we want to help you. If we can help you in any way, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. If you would like to find out more about the Southgate Church of Christ, head to our website at www.southgatechurchofchrist.org. There you can find all the information that you need, our location, our phone number, an email address, anything you need to reach out to us because we would love to have you be a part of our body here at Southgate. If you haven't already done so, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so every time we post a new lesson, you will be notified and you can be alerted so you can listen to each and every lesson from the Southgate Church of Christ.